Mon repository done uh, the .NET way, that is using technologies available to .NET developers. First, uh, a couple of words about me. Uh, as Alona said, I'm a lead .NET software engineer at SoftServe with more than six years of experience at this point. I'm also a technical interviewer and a mentor. And after work, I like learning Chinese, swimming, uh, playing chess and go, brewing tea and cooking. So uh, that's enough info about me. Let's dive in. First, we would need to, to better understand what a mono repository is. Let's first uh, discuss what other approaches there are. And um, a more common approach is a poly repository. Um, it consists of two parts, prefix poly, which means many, and repository, which means source code repository. Um, it's an approach to development when we store all our applications separately. That is for each web service or front-end application or class library, we have a separate uh, Git repository. And uh, it contrasts with uh, Mono repository, which we'll talk about today. Uh, when we have prefix uh, Mono, which means one, that is we store all our source code for multiple applications in a single repository. And of course, uh, there are uh, mixed approaches when we have uh, some number of mono repositories, but uh, it's like already a derivative. So we will focus on these uh, clear definitions. Let's talk about a poly repository first, because it's a better known approach. It's, um, I would even say it's a standard one uh, when uh, teams start new projects. So uh, this talk is based on uh, my experience on uh, my, one of my projects at SoftServe, uh, which we started with Poly repository and then uh, migrated to uh, Mono repository with uh, all the things we learned uh, uh, along the way. Uh, I will show you. So we had a couple of web services um, in the beginning. Uh, we also had some background services, uh, two databases, um, a class library, and a repository with uh, infrastructure as code we uh, use in Terraform. Now, uh, as you have noticed, we have two web services, and usually they need to communicate with one another. Let's uh, discuss how this communication can uh, be done. Uh, we will focus on um, uh, design time characteristics of this communication, not runtime like synchronous or asynchronous, uh, because it's relevant in the scope of this presentation. So to begin with, we have to get repositories in, and we need to somehow um, move information from one to another. So for example, we need to uh, know which APIs are available in one service so that we can consume them in another one. And the simplest approach is to write some documentation. Uh, we get a developer who writes it and uh, another developer reads it and uh, writes the second service in accordance. Uh, well, uh, this is uh, the oldest approach to do that. And um, it's uh, it has a lot of drawbacks. For example, uh, writing documentation is error prone and is time consuming. And um, the same goes for consuming uh, it. So we can make a lot of uh, mistakes along the way and it takes a lot of time to do so. So to make this process better, we can use not um, free format documentation, but rather uh, some standard like uh, open API docs uh, that uh, are pretty strictly defined, and we won't have any uh, ambiguities in, in reading the documentation. And uh, because um, now um, it's strictly defined, we can replace our developers, which, uh, frankly speaking, have better things to do than writing and reading docs, with um, services that can uh, generate uh, this open API spec based on uh, our code and uh, that can also generate um, clients based on uh, open API spec. And uh, such tools um, are already available on the market um, and there are 
a lot of free uh, alternatives. And well, this would be a good place to stop. And if you know nothing about uh, the nature of uh, services that are communicating, but if we know that uh, they are both .NET services and there are no other technologies used, uh, and it's often the case when we, for example, use uh, microservices. We have a lot of microservices. Uh, all of them uh, are written in .NET. Uh, then we can uh, replace this open API spec with a new get package and um, use built-in uh, tooling that allows us to publish new get packages and consume them. And uh, this would be much simpler um, compared to the open API spec. Uh, so what, what do we have in that uh, NuGet package? In it, we would have uh, an SDK that allows us to call uh, the service. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, the one I prefer and the one we have used on that project is a uh, repeat library. Um, so it looks like, like that. We uh, declare an interface and adorn it with uh, attributes that tell uh, Rikit how we want to make calls. So here you, you can see a simple client API, which allows you to perform fruit operations for clients. And um, that uh, has a strongly typed interface. Uh, we don't need to write any code for it because it will be generated automatically by Rikit. So we put this uh, declaration in our new get package, then we consume this new get package, and we only need to write the following uh, thing. We create a service for this iClients API. Um, and we get our strongly typed API back. So uh, that, that's very simple. Uh, and that's how we started this project. And um, let's first analyze if it was a good choice or not. Um, and to do that, I will refer to an article called Public versus Published Interfaces, uh, written by Martin Fowler, in which he describes two types of interfaces that is, well, public and published. <laughs> so, um, and I think that the distinction is important. So let's take a closer look. In both cases, we have uh, some module, what he calls it. It can be either a class or um, in our case, it would be a web service. The thing is that it has an interface that consumers use. And the difference is in what we control within this. In public interfaces, we control everything. We control uh, the uh, provider of the interface and its consumers, all of its consumers. While in published interface, we only control the provider of the interface, that is the service. And there are other people who create services that call our service. That's, um, that might look like not a big deal, but um, I assure you it is because um, in published interface, this, uh, well, interface becomes a contract between us and this second party, uh, this consumers of the interface. And um, the same goes uh, as with legal contract. It's very difficult to change it. So we will have to use versioning. We will have to uh, deprecate uh, our API little by little. And we will have to make sure that we don't uh, break any of our consumers at all times. That's not true for public interfaces because we can change them all at once. So let's get back to our um, uh, communication diagram. And um, well, what I would like to know if, if it's public or published. And well, frankly speaking, there is not enough information here. It can be both. And well, its usual answer is it, is, it depends. And let's take a look at what it depends on. It depends on our zone of control as in the, was in the definition. So if we control both the services, then it's 
uh, public interface. And if we only consume uh, publishing of this uh, NuGet package, then it is a published interface. So in our case, uh, in my project, it was a public interface because it was our team who uh, controlled all the services. And um, I can already see a big, um, well, not a big, uh, a small problem here that uh, we use NuGet packages to um, provide um, this interface to different services. And NuGet packages, they, first of all, we uh, say that we publish NuGet packages when we publish them. Uh, we uh, use version for NuGet packages. When for public interfaces, we don't need to have any version of it. Um, and I would say that it was um, a first bell, um, but we didn't pay attention to it, that something wasn't quite uh, right in this design. So that's how we started the project. It and see, it see, it, so sorry, can I yeah. Just, yeah, just just by by publishing this this package? Yeah, I think you, in a sense, you you made it published. Yeah. If, yeah, sure. So I mean that we use um, no, no. I I mean I mean the zone of control. If if you if you publish the NuGet package, I, I guess it makes it a published zone. I mean you you lose control over it, yeah, because you, you don't know who gonna use it. I mean I know you. Yeah, well, in a close project. Know that, then yes, it's published. But if you publish it to a private NuGet feed that only your team has access to, then oh, yeah. that's it's still yeah. public. So yeah. th that was the case. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Thank you. And so um, that's how we uh, were living for, uh, well, over a year. And uh, over this period, uh, the team grew bigger and we um, created a number of uh, services. And um, well, it was a startup uh, type of company. So they often had um, last time changes uh, when we uh, need to ASAP add some fields and uh, it needs to be uh, passed to all the services and store it and some functionality needs to be implemented based on it. And so even in a well-designed system, this uh, leads to making a lot of changes to uh, multiple services at once. And uh, now uh, I will show you what the process of uh, making these changes, that is the process of implementing a story uh, looked like. So let's say uh, I added a field to one service, uh, then uh, it was consumed by another and uh, a third service that, for example, stored it in database for uh, I know, analytics. Uh, and so I've created uh, all of that, created three pull requests. And uh, this, uh, well, those of you who use GitHub are familiar with this notation. Uh, this yellow circle means that um, it kicked off build. Uh, and tests uh, to make sure that everything is working right. So you create uh, three pull requests, wait for code review and wait for builds to pass. Uh, and you go grab a cup of coffee because it can take uh, from five to 30 minutes, really depending on the size of your project, uh, on the number of people uh, building at once on your uh, CI infrastructure and a lot of other factors. So you can come back in 30 minutes and you see that all three of your pull requests are approved. Um, uh, two of them got two appro approvals and uh, the last one got one uh, for whatever reason, but uh, you still can merge it, so that's all right. And um, you merge the first one and to use uh, these fields in uh, the other pull requests, you need to uh, publish a version of NuGet package, right? Uh, updated so that you can consume the updated version in those pull requests and uh, then merge this into main. Um, so uh, you update this version and this once again, because you have made some changes, kicks off builds and tests. So you go grab another cup of coffee, wait for another 30 minutes, and uh, when you come back, you see that one of those two pull requests uh, has uh, conflicts because somebody else has merged before you, um, which happens quite often in a startup-like environment because uh, there are a lot of people working, a lot of changes, 
and everything uh, needs to be done ASAP and there are not a lot of uh, like bureaucracy uh, getting in the way. And uh, the third pull request, uh, you can see that uh, it's now blocked because uh, the second reviewer has requested changes to be made. So, uh, well, it turns out that uh, he didn't forget about this pull request. He was in the in the middle of reviewing it. So um, that that's fine, you would uh, think, but um, uh, let's think about what um, what's happening to our services at this moment. Uh, we have merged some part of functionality into uh, one service and haven't merged it into other services. That means that because we don't use versioning, uh, we don't, uh, we are not backwards compatible. That means that we uh, may have introduced um, bugs in the system or when uh, the services can communicate with one another because we have changed the contract, but only in, in one place, not everywhere. So if somebody on your team uh, pulls the latest uh, changes from main and uh, starts debugging the service, they might uh, might find this issue. Or if you deploy at this point uh, this to a QA or dev environment, um, your QA team will, will find this issue. So uh, you have to uh, either write and uh, in, in Teams or Slack or whatever you use, and notify everybody that, uh, well, the services are basically uh, broken or they can potentially be broken. Um, or you just need to uh, merge uh, all the changes ASAP and hope that no one notices. So uh, that's what you would do. Uh, you make the changes, uh, you resolve conflicts, uh, you uh, answer all the uh, questions, um, all the comments, uh, or make uh, the uh, requested changes, which, in turn, kicks off. What was that? The third time uh, it kicks off the build. You have to wait for another thirty minutes. You have to drink the third cup of coffee, uh, which is not healthy at this point. Um, and uh, then you finally get all your pull requests approved and ready to merge. And you do just that. Well. Um, I guess uh, you agree with me that it looked a little complicated, uh, maybe a little too much uh, for just adding a couple of fields and maybe a few calculations based on those. Uh, but that's what it looked like for my team. And um, <clears throat> we needed to do something about that. The problem was that your services can uh, get out of sync. So even though those are uh, this is a public interface and your team can make changes to all of the services at once, you see this uh, that this at once is not actually uh, atomic. It's not at once as you would want it to be. Um, just because of the uh, technical uh, difficulties. And um, that would be awesome to, to make it atomic as we have in um, databases or because we have transactions uh, in databases for that same purpose, to keep our uh, data consistent. And in this case, to keep our um, services in consistent state. And uh, fortunately, uh, we don't have to use uh, databases to store our source code because we have Git for this. And uh, it's an awesome tool. and um, it has commits and commit is exactly one, what we want. So a commit is a set of changes made to files in the repository all at once so that we can either uh, well, commit this commit or roll back this commit. And um, as I have said, it's, it's done atomically and we can't really commit half of it. So uh, let's let's think how this can be done. I'm sure that all of you have uh, this folder um, on their computer, something like a repos folder or repositories or 
projects or work or whatever, uh, which has all the um, source control repositories stored in it inside of a separate folder, like here, service one, service two, and service three. And um, the structure uh, of a mono repository that you want to get would uh, look exactly like that, just one uh, folder up. So that this, uh, we would have this service one, service two, and service three inside of our uh, Git repository. And um, this would allow us to make uh, changes to all the service atomically, uh, because uh, now we would have the power of Git commits. And uh, not only that, uh, please uh, notice that we have uh, these files, uh, git ignore, docker ignore, code owners, and others that are often uh, repeated in different services. And especially if we have uh, the same people working on all the services, <clears throat> it, um, um, it stands to reason that uh, those files would be the same or very similar. And uh, now that we have a mono repository, we don't really need to repeat all those files. We can move them one folder up and have them all in one place. So this is our ideal state that we want to be in. But the question now is, how do we get there? Because as I have already said, um, most projects don't start with a mono repository. They start with a poly repository approach. And then as they grow and as uh, people understand what's needed in their day-to-day uh, -day job, um, how to make it more productive, uh, people migrate to mono repository. Not always, but sometimes. So uh, obviously we can just copy paste uh, this all this uh, source code and call it a day. But um, I'm sure many of you would uh, ask what about Git history because we use it um, quite often to uh, find root cause of bugs to just understand the reason behind uh, the code we see why it it was written like that and it's especially important for um, older projects that uh, already have uh, some history associated with them and uh, fortunately we can preserve git history when when doing that for all the files so we don't uh, we won't lose anything let's take a closer look at how to do that So here on the left, you can see um, the uh, directory structure um, on your computer, uh, this folder repos, an empty folder with an empty mono repository that we have just created, and a folder service one with uh, the first service that we want to move. And now uh, you will see a bash script that moves it. So first we uh, move to this directory of service one, uh, pull the latest uh, checkout main and pull the latest changes. But even before that, I encourage you to um, archive your repositories on GitHub, uh, or I'm sure there are alternatives in, in Bitbucket as well, or in GitLab, uh, to make sure that nobody makes changes to uh, the repositories while you are moving them. It doesn't take a lot of time. As you will see, it's like a matter of five minutes to do that. Um, and um, I really encourage you to archive those repositories to make sure you don't lose uh, changes that other people make. So um, we are on the latest main, then we create a branch and set uh, shell options that will be required by the next command. We create a folder called service and move everything except for the uh, git folder uh, to this uh, folder service. So uh, you see this pattern uh, with a git folder that we use. Uh, that's why we needed the previous command because not, not all shells allow to do that right away. And uh, pay attention to the uh, structure on the left to see how it changes. So here you can see that we've created a folder called service one in, inside of uh, the uh, service one folder. And we will see why it's important uh, a bit later. We commit our changes. And um, 
push them to uh, the remote repository. Now we move to our mono repository, add uh, this service uh, as a remote repository so that we can pull uh, uh, the changes from it. And uh, this is uh, the crucial part. We uh, merge this branch that we have just create, created, uh, moving to monorepo uh, into uh, the main branch of monorepository. And we use this flag allow unrelated histories, which allows um, Git to merge two branches which have no commits in common. Because uh, as you know, uh, Git repositories usually uh, contain um, branches which um, all start from a single commit. And, um, um, and that's how basically Git works. It adds new commits on top of the previous ones. Um, so it would be unusual to encounter such a case uh, without having multiple repositories. But here we uh, must use a Slack because we obviously we don't have uh, common commits in different repositories which know nothing about each other. So we uh, merge in this um, branch and uh, this folder service on appears in our mono repository. All we need uh, is to push the changes and do some cleanup after that. That is, uh, remove uh, this remote because we no longer need it, and uh, go to the starting position uh, to just repeat the script as many times as we need to move uh, other services. So as you can see, is uh, the, the crux of the script is just uh, basically two commands to add this remote. Uh, repository and to merge changes from it. Um, so I guess now you can see why we need this uh, folder service one, because if we merge uh, multiple services at once, uh, service two and service three, uh, which all have um, files in common, that is, for example, git ignore or docker ignore, uh, we would get conflicts at this point because there are two files, uh, potentially two different files, and we would need to resolve it somehow. I really strongly encourage you not to uh, resolve these conflicts, uh, but rather to use this approach with folders I showed you because it's much simpler to do that. You won't have any problems with it, and you can um, unify all those files later. It will be much, uh, much more convenient, much less error prone, it will be uh, simpler to review, and well, there is just no uh, drawbacks to this approach. So now that we have the script, uh, we have migrated to uh, a mono repository, and finally, we can do uh, we can make changes to all the services at once, and they are always in sync because there is just no way to to unsync them. Um, and we have also unified these files uh, that I have shown you, uh, Docker ignore and Git ignore and so on. Uh, but that's not all that we can do. Let's take a look at uh, our uh, diagram, at how we have uh, used uh, NuGet packages to share information between two different repositories. And um, now that we have only one repository, we don't really need to use uh, NuGet packages for that. We can just replace this with direct project-to-project uh, -project references, and that's it. Um, you always uh, see the latest information. You don't have to update any versions, nothing like that, and it's very convenient. So that's what we did, and um, I would like to add a caveat here uh, that uh, you need to uh, be uh, very vigilant after that because um, it's difficult to do uh, the wrong thing when um, you have uh, to publish new get packages to share information. But it's very easy to add just a, a project reference to something that you need, uh, like to data access layer from a different API, um, which you uh, obviously shouldn't be able to do. Uh, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. But with uh, this approach to mono repository, it's, uh, it becomes quite easy. So uh, that's why I encourage um, tech leads uh, and architects among you, or just uh, senior developers who um, 
can also take part in that to um, keep an eye on the health of your architecture uh, to make sure that it doesn't drift, that you don't introduce um, unwanted dependencies and unwanted links. For example, I uh, like to um, look at um, project uh, architecture diagram in uh, Rider from time to time, which shows references between different projects, and I can just uh, visually identify those uh, unwanted references if if they appear. Um, or you can um, be a little more sophisticated and uh, write uh, what's called architecture uh, tests or architecture fitness functions uh, using uh, the uh, net arc test library, uh, which allows you to do a lot of cool stuff to automate that. But um, I won't uh, dive deeply uh, into this library in this talk. So uh, we, we moved to a mono repository and we were really happy with that and because it solves uh, the problems we had. Um, but as you know, with, um, with everything new, even though it often solves your problems, you often uh, later find uh, different problems. So uh, that's what has happened to us. One day, um, well, we, we had SonarCube uh, set up, and um, one day I was checking project coverage uh, with unit tests, and I noticed that uh, it was um, a lowering. Uh, so we uh, had a target of 80% of coverage, which uh, I think is reasonable, uh, but um, it was uh, at 75 at this point, and um, I um, uh, kept an eye on it, and uh, it lowered to 70 uh, in a couple of weeks. And um, that's why uh, that's when I decided to uh, make something about it. Um, and the thing is that uh, all the services, uh, they look the same, and there is no reason uh, why uh, this should be happening. Uh, there was no changes to our processes. Uh, the coverage was still required. And um, well, the first thing I thought about is that somebody wasn't writing tests, but uh, we had the process of writing them and of making sure they are present. And we also had a code review checklist that would be used to, um, to see if, if there are um, enough tests written. So, um, so I thought that it's not the case, that must be some problem with, um, I don't know, with infrastructure with, or with something else, not, not with uh, tests. And um, I went to SonarCube. It allows you to um, see coverage for different uh, modules, that is for different uh, like folders in your uh, project, and even for different files. And uh, what I noticed is that uh, our new project that we were working on uh, for the last, like maybe, I don't know, maybe a month, uh, it had uh, like zero coverage. And it, it just wasn't true because uh, I have written some test myself in this project. So uh, it was obviously wrong. And um, I started to uh, look in, into uh, the project files to see what's wrong with them. And uh, now we will uh, take a look at three different um, project files for testing projects. Um, two of which have everything working correctly, and uh, one of which just doesn't show you any coverage. And uh, uh, while I'm sure many of you may uh, already know the answer, the answer just from my um, explanation, um, it takes quite a lot of time if you don't know it. So let's take a look. So here you can see uh, a project file, which is an XML file with uh, properties uh, that uh, define how to handle your project and uh, package references that show which MIGET packages you use and um, project references that uh, show you which uh, project this one uh, depends on. As you can see, uh, these uh, projects are quite similar. Uh, they look, I, I would even say they look very similar but yet uh, some of them work and some of them don't. 
So, um, so what's what's going on? What's the difference between them? And um, actually, uh, there are a lot of difference. I would say a ton of differences. Uh, for example, um, in one of the files, uh, company, authors, and assembly name uh, properties were not defined, but uh, I don't think it impacts uh, code coverage. And in in one of the files, in a different one, uh, there was no uh, reference to a test core project, which was present in in the other two, uh, but it uh, it wasn't the case for this problem. Also, there was different indentation in, in different files, and um, what what was the real problem here is uh, that there was no re reference to uh, the NuGet package called Cover Collector which uh, is responsible for uh, converting uh, between different formats of this uh, code coverage report. And um, as I added this re reference, we, um, we had our coverage uh, jump to 80%, which was as expected, and the problem was fixed. But um, I wasn't really satisfied with it uh, because uh, it wasn't the real problem. Uh, why it has appeared. I would say that the real problem was uh, duplication, because as you have seen, these files, they are 90, 95% the same, and um, they only differ in very small things. Um, and even more, they should be exactly the same in, in most of the things. So uh, let's um, discuss, discuss how this can be done. And uh, fortunately, we have MS Build, which is a build system that uh, .NET uses. Um, it uh, basically uses our project files as instructions on how to build our uh, services or projects. So this XML uh, code that you've seen, uh, these uh, are instructions to uh, MS Build. And um, also, MS Build knows about uh, a file called uh, directory build props, which uh, it can use to um, improve uh, our builds. So uh, it is looking for this file higher uh, in, in the folder hierarchy than uh, the project that it built, is built in. And, uh, when it finds one, it imports it. So we can uh, define our uh, common statements in this file, and then they would be the same for all the projects uh, like, um, in this uh, folder. Let's take a look. So here you can see that we have uh, our mono repository, and we would put uh, this directory build props file uh, just here in the root of the repository. and um, it would apply to all the projects in, in this repository. Let's take a look at what's inside of it. Inside, we have uh, basically the same thing as we have in our project files. So almost anything we can do there, we can do here. We defi all, define all our properties. We define uh, packages that we use. Um, and uh, what's interesting, so here you can see that we use style group, uh, for all our projects. But there is also a section with a condition here. Um, so uh, if you really, well, there is no syntax highlighting, so it's a, a little difficult to read. But uh, if you if you try, then um, you will see that we uh, check that there is a substring test in the name of the project. So um, we had all the test projects uh, and in tests. So we have like service one unit tests. Service one integration tests and so on. Service one performance tests, and uh, if we see this uh, test um, uh, anywhere inside the name of the project, we will import a ton of uh, libraries like coverlet collector that we forgot to import, and also in and unit uh, like fluent assertions and other libraries that we supposedly need in all our tests. And uh, then our project file would look like that. We remove everything that's common from it, uh, and we only 
um, leave what's important. So what's important are those references that uh, this project has and other projects don't have. So for example, um, this was a test project for service one. So it depended on the contracts of service one. And it also needed uh, this library called test score, which was um, like some com common utilities for our tests. Uh, but um, it wasn't used by all tests, so we've only uh, left it here. We haven't extracted it to um, to the directory build props. So at this point, the only thing that's repeating is this uh, SDK directive, but we can't really remove it because um, it's uh, the first thing that uh, tells MS build. Uh, how to build the project, and if we remove it, it won't even look for this directory build props file. So it, it must remain here. Now uh, we have properly solved this problem. It won't appear ever again when we add a new service and forget to import some libraries because we have everything imported um, in one place. And um, the life continued. We were growing, uh, creating new services, and so on, adding new functionality, um, having team buildings. And um, then the next problem appeared uh, that is, this one uh, couldn't load file or assembly or one of its dependencies. The located assembly's manifest definition doesn't match the assembly reference. And I'm sure, uh, once again, as with the previous problem, many of you uh, have seen this and have solved this and um, know uh, what to do right away. Uh, yet, uh, I really encourage you to solve uh, the deeper problem, because um, if you don't know what to do with it, it uh, can take a lot of time to solve it. And uh, what's the problem here? for those of you who haven't seen it the problem is with dependencies when we have our project a depending on uh, two different packages b and c which in turn depend on different versions of uh, a package d so in this case you can see that we have version 1.2 and 1.3 and when uh, we are building our projects all of the uh, dlls um, uh, this and you get packages they are copied uh, to the direct to the output directory and um, there will be only one copy of um, library d left at this point and what's what's even um, more difficult about that is that this will be a, a random version of a library and it can change from time to time because uh, the uh, build order is not deterministic and um, this um, this version that is copied the last will remain there and so this leads to that it can work on my machine but it doesn't work on, on the server or on someone else's machine in our case uh, we ended up in this situation when we were uh, updating packages and we uh, just forgot uh, to update it in one place so we have uh, switched to point uh, to version 1.3 everywhere, but uh, left 1.2 in one place just accidentally, and uh, then spent a considerable amount of time uh, fixing this. And as you may have guessed, I wasn't satisfied with just updating the version. I wanted uh, this problem to uh, to remain in the past and never appear again. And um, Fortunately, there is a file called directory packages props used by MS build that, that can help us to do just that. It's uh, also known as uh, central package management feature, which was introduced, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, NuGet 8, I think, um, relatively recently. Um, let's take a look at how central package management works. It allows us to put this file directory packages props uh, next to our directory build props. And uh, this is where we would store uh, versions of our packages that we depend on. 
So here you can see also very similar. Um, here we have package versions where we specify all the packages we use in our projects and their corresponding versions. And we also need uh, to set this package version centrally uh, property to true to, to make it work. And there are also other uh, properties like uh, you can see here, uh, central package transitive pinning um, and um, a version override, uh, but we won't discuss that. The only thing I will say is that um, I encourage you not to override uh, the centrally managed version because it defeats the purpose of, of managing it centrally, that it's one everywhere. But if you like really need it in, in the very uh, edge case, you can uh, fall back on it. And uh, here you can see uh, the previous version of uh, package references that we have in our directory build probes and in our project files. And uh, we remove version from here. We replace it with just package references. So we still declare what we use, but the version is determined centrally in one place so that we don't have any conflicts. Now that we have done that, let's uh, take a look at our journey to see uh, what we uh, did. So this is an old project file, a big uh, one with a lot of uh, craft in it, uh, a lot of duplication that's very difficult to read. And here is a new one, which only has what's important for this project uh, so that you can see everything that matters at a glance and uh, without uh, versions so that they are the same everywhere. So this was our journey that we um, went on with this project. And um, in conclusion, I would like to say that um, the first thing that people learn, uh, well, maybe not, not literally the first, but one of the first things that people learn when they learn programming is uh, to write good code, to um, use patterns to uh, not repeat yourself, to uh, keep your code solid and so on. Uh, but uh, when it comes to writing project files or uh, scripts uh, or bash scripts or like uh, groovy scripts for Jenkins or YAML files or any other file that's not C sharp in our case, uh, people somehow just forget that we should write uh, reasonable code that um, it should be clear and understandable, and that um, this reduces uh, uh, mistakes and bugs. As you have seen, we uh, all our bugs in this process were because we were repeating something. We were repeating our uh, configuration for projects at first, and then we were repeating package versions. So I really encourage you to keep it dry, not only with your code, but also with everything that's around it. So don't forget about your uh, Docker file, about your scripts, all this stuff. It's, it also matters. So uh, that would be it. Um, I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, yeah, guys, if uh, someone has any questions, please unmute and ask. And he, he, here are some references that, that uh, you can use uh, on things that I uh, didn't talk about that you can read later. Hello, uh, I have a question. So first of all, thanks for sharing your um, ideas and your experience. Uh, I've also had a chance to work with Monorepo before and it even had different technologies in it. And it was really a breeze working with it and have a single CI pipeline. But I wanted to ask if you know, is there any um, uh, cloud service that supports this for .NET, especially is there any cloud service for Azure? Because in uh, my current project here at SoftSurf, um, we have the DevOps team on the customer's side and they are very opinionated. Uh, and usually they, um, well, first of all, we are not allowed to define any CI CD processes at all. And we need to 
conform to their requirements. And they actually forced us to, um, to have multiple repositories. Um, every Nougat package, every executable application is in its own repository. And it's really a, a pain. But I think if there was actually support for um, monorepos uh, in Azure, then maybe we would be able to convince them to to um, to change it into a yes. monorepo. So sure, I, I got it. So um, I'm only not sure about what, what do you mean by uh, support for monorepo. So from my experience, um, for example, for builds in Jenkins, you just specify a folder that you want to build, and then it's as if it was in a separate repository. And for uh, deploying it to, for deploying get packages, you just build a get package and publish it. And for the same goes for uh, Docker images, you just build an image and push it. So from DevOps perspective, they will still have like a lot of different uh, images and so on. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, I understand, but like, um, are you aware if there's any official support like any cloud service provider says we have a pipeline we have pipeline templates for your monorepo mm -hmm. or is it always like uh, specifying another pipeline for another directory yeah got that's it. what our um, devops team doesn't allow us to do mm -hmm. got it so um frankly speaking I'm, I'm not aware of um such services in asia for dotnet um, but I know that there are some available for JavaScript, for example. Um, um, but for .NET, I'm not sure about that. Okay, so we would need to define our pipelines in YAML files, and because we are not allowed to, then there is no way to progress. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks for answering. Any other questions? Yeah, oh, I have one small. So thank you for your presentation. And the question is, uh, how do you handle your continuous integration? Do I get it right? So if you do one commit and merge it into master, you have to rebuild and publish all the services you have each time. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Uh, that's, that's a good question. And um, the short answer is uh, yes. Uh, the longer answer is that um, it's not that bad uh, because uh, if you only um, make changes to uh, one service, then um, what happens is that uh, this build sees that you've only changed, uh, you haven't changed files from other services and uh, it takes them from a cache. So we have used um, cache in um, block storage for uh, Docker um, image layers. And so it would only uh, pull them from cache and that's it. So in essence, it only adds like a new tag and that's it. So yeah, but it, you, 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 still, you still will have to run all the tests yeah, one more yeah. time if you, okay. Yeah, well, uh, only tests that uh, are impacted. So if uh, there is nothing that your tests depend on, then they wouldn't run because you would just take a cached uh, layer from, uh, from the build cache. Also, if I'm correct, and if I remember correctly, uh, if you, for example, use um, Azure DevOps, um, you can specify in build uh, pipelines that you want to build only part, um, even of the monorepo. So you can have like three different build pipelines for one monorepo, and which which build each build pipeline would cover only one part of this monorepo. So, for example, if you rebuild um just a one just one service from from all the repo it will build just this one service and uh, run test coverage only for this one i'm not sure how it works on, yeah for example, right. this bucket or other yeah we've tried the same in jenkins uh, but uh, it wasn't the final solution uh, because um, the thing is that your service um has um it doesn't have everything it needs in, in one folder. It has references to other services, to other folders. And so you have to either input all those folders um, and then you would frankly get like a lot of builds. Or uh, what we did is that we've um, 
in our Docker files, we only copy what, what's needed. So for example, if you build a service, then we copy source code for this service and we copy um, uh, projects that it depends on, like contracts of other services. And so uh, this leads to use of this uh, caching in Docker build. Uh, so if you don't change, if you change a different service, but you don't change it, its contract, then other services that use it won't have to be rebuilt because the uh, contract is intact. And maybe one more last question. And uh, how did yeah, you? Have... Oh, sorry, proceed. How did you approach the rollback in this situation when you are having monorepo? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. How are you approaching rollback function or, or you know, ah. from uh, 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 free services mm -hmm. deployed over the hundreds, right? Something. Mm -hmm. uh, so rollback is uh, exactly the same as you would do for for anything else. You just, I mean, if you need to uh, roll back your commits, then you uh, revert them. Or if you need to roll back a deployment, then you can roll back deploy in a specific version because at the time of deployment, you deploy uh, different artifacts. There is no connection between uh, like uh, them at this point. So if you have only changed internals of one service, then you can only you can roll back this deployment, and that's it. And maybe last last question. Yeah, we can continue this topic. So how do you version in your monorepo? What if you need to update only some, you know, some one microservice from, from plenty of others? How do you version them separately when you have a single repo? Well, I don't need to because it's only my team working in this monorepo and uh, we can make changes to all of the services at once. So we don't really need to add a version to them. So the whole account is only your team, right? Which yeah. is up to 10 people? Uh, it was 20, 20 something people. So how how this project can grow in this case? What if you have 20 more people which are separate teams? How you will work on this single repo? Have you mentioned so, this? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, well, uh, the point of, of that is that we don't need to use versioning and um, we have shared uh, knowledge between all of our team members so that uh, anybody can go into any uh, project and make changes there so there are no like silos of knowledge and uh, so this leads to that if you need to make changes then you just do that and and that's it so you can make all the changes by yourself you don't need to wait for somebody from like a different team uh, or sub team to do that okay so it's just a small project how many microservices you have in it i just maybe missed this piece because i joined five minutes later mm -hmm. yeah so um let me recall so it was uh probably uh, at about 15 services at this point. So it, it was much smaller at once and then it grew to, to this number. Mm 